Looking back, I think Theopolis was born out of two things, boredom and a growing sense of age. Uh, I had been teaching at New St. Andrews College for 15 years. Uh, most of that time I had been teaching the same undergraduate class, a Bible survey, a basic theology introduction, which is a great class. I love the students. We started a graduate program, so I was able to teach at a higher level. That was also uh, enjoyable. I planted a church, which added some spice to, spice to things and pastored that church for 10 years. But I realized um, in the early 2010s that I was getting bored with undergraduate teaching. And I realized that uh, I wanted something more challenging to do with my life. Uh, I could have stayed at New St. Andrews College for the rest of my life. It would have been an a, uh, enjoyable life. It would have been a fairly easy life. It would have been a low stress life. I could have coasted in uh, to retirement teaching at New St. Andrews, you know, teaching the same theology course for 30 years instead of 15, or 40 years instead of 15. But I had the sense, growing sense, that I wanted to do something more, that I wanted, I thought of it at the time as some, I wanted something to keep me up at night, something that would stress me. And I felt like I wasn't really being challenged. I didn't feel like I was doing the, everything that I could do and wanted to do something more with my life. And that, combined with that, was a growing sense of, of age. I was in my 50s. I had been part of the Biblical Horizons group with Jim Jordan and Jeff Myers and Rich Bledsoe and others for decades, and we had done some amazing work. Uh, we had done an annual conference through Biblical Horizons for 20-some years, and Jim's work was inspiring to us, and uh, it set the agenda for everything that I have done in my theological writing and teaching. Uh, everything that Jeff has done as a pastor has been uh, inspired and infused with things that we learned from Jim and learned from one another at the Biblical Horizons Conference. But as uh, I was entering my 50s, Jim was a dec is a decade older, and so I began to think about the future of Biblical Horizons, and there really wasn't a future for Biblical Horizons. Uh, Jim set up Biblical Horizons as an organization organizational structure basically to enable him to do his speaking and writing. That was, that was the purpose of it. He didn't really envision it as something that would continue past his lifetime. But uh, we had done so much good stuff through Biblical Horizons. I wanted something that would carry on that legacy, consolidate it, and then pass it on to a new generation. And so uh, as I conceived at Theopolis talking to Jim, Jeff, and others, uh, we decided we needed something that would be continuing the, the Biblical Horizons project, not, not stop as if we had arrived with everything because we didn't believe we had, but continue the, continue the work that Biblical Horizons had been, had been doing, but then pass on what we had done to a new generation. Uh, so Theopolis is like Biblical Horizons 2.0 uh, with a specific purpose of extending beyond our lifetimes. We wanted it to be something that would continue to exist even when we weren't around to run it, uh, we wanted to have people in place who had been, who we had taught, who had been formed by this kind of theology and this kind of liturgy, this kind of outlook on the Bible and on the world. We want to have people that would for, were formed by that that could carry on the work uh, through the next generation and hopefully beyond. So uh, boredom and a, a growing sense of old age, boredom and a midlife crisis, you could say, were the two sources of Theopolis. Uh, we looked for a number, a number of places or thought about a number of places to settle with Theopolis. Uh, we were looking for a place that had a church that would support us. And there were a number of places that we uh, talked to churches that would be provide a, uh, provide a supporting structure for us. Uh, we, we talked about Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, we talked about going to St. Louis where Jeff Myers has his church. Um, uh, Birmingham was, uh, was a place that we thought of because uh, Trinity Presbyterian Church, a series C church was here, a church that I had pastored years ago and a church that was very much in sync with what we were trying to do at Theopolis. We were looking for that. We were looking for a place where we had seminary students accessible. That was the, that was the downside of Monroe because Monroe doesn't have a seminary anywhere nearby. Uh, St. Louis has a number of seminaries nearby, so that was, a, that was a plus for St. Louis. But then we were also looking for a place where Noel and I wanted to settle, and we were thinking this is, this is our final move we moved a lot in our lifetimes, and we didn't want to move again after we made this final move. And so uh, the, the thing that really decided it in favor of Birmingham was the fact that we had lived here before. We lived here for six years. 
uh, we'd felt all the way through our time in Idaho that we were really out of place there. We weren't quite settled permanently in Idaho. Uh, Noel certainly felt like a Southerner the whole time, mainly because she was cold for 15 years. Uh, and um, so I, I had strong attachments to the South. So moving back to Birmingham was uh, partly a personal decision, but also with the church and with Beeson Divinity School here and some other theological schools, we were hoping we can connect with them and have students from those seminaries that would be part of our work at Theopolis. I, I announced my departure from New St. Andrews College at, at the beginning of the 2012 school year and didn't leave until that school year was over, that 2012-2013. We moved during the summer of 2013 and then started classes for Theopolis in August of 2013. Um, but I announced it a, a year ahead of time. So I, I was a, a lame duck professor of theology for a year. Uh, that gave New St. Andrews time to find somebody else, to, somebody to replace me when I was gone. And it also gave us a little bit of time to kind of get, get things set up, get some of the uh, documents done that we need to get done to set up as, an, as a legal entity in the state of Alabama um, and to do some fundraising. Uh, I knew nothing about fundraising. I know uh, marginally more about fundraising after 10 years of Theopolis. Um, my, my idea of fundraising was try to think about people that I knew that had money and ask them for it. Uh, I had never done that before. Uh, I prided myself on not asking for handouts. Uh, and I had never been in a position where I was fundraising for anything. Uh, but uh, Theopolis... Had, I, I, felt, I felt this uh, impulsion with Theopolis. Uh, I felt like uh, we were being sent out from Moscow to Birmingham, not, not, um, not dragging ourselves out, but I felt like the Spirit was sending us and compelling us to do this. Uh, and that uh, overcame whatever reluctance I had to, to ask for money. And so I asked for money from people in Moscow. I asked for money from people that I knew outside of Moscow, and we got a little bit of money. I had some savings that I was willing to expend. And then uh, out of nowhere, uh, our largest source of funding for the first five or six years of our operation came from Arthur Kay. Arthur Kay, uh, I, I knew him as a pastor in England. I had never met the man. He was an old friend of Jim Jordan's. Uh, and I had no idea he had any kind of money. He was not somebody who was on my list to ask for money. But in addition to... Um, being a pastor, he had run a company for a long time, a software company, uh, and he had been saving money through that whole time uh, so that he could help start something like Theopolis. He was looking for something like Theopolis to put his money into. And so when he learned about uh, the starting of Theopolis, he uh, very uh, readily and extremely generously started funding us, gave us a, a sizable donation every month for the first few years. Uh, and beyond the first few years, even after his monthly donations stopped, uh, we continued to live off those donations because our, our expenses were very low at the beginning. And we were able to live off those uh, donations and the savings from those donations for a number of years. Maybe half of the life of Theopolis uh, was funded from that and it, those initial gifts from Arthur K. So we, we owe a lot to him. We owe a lot to lots of other people who have donated both in those early years and uh, and since, we have some very generous donors, but uh, Arthur K. really laid the foundation. We're, we're very grateful to him. We wouldn't exist. Uh, we wouldn't have survived uh, as we have and flourished as we have without Arthur K.'s generosity to us. The full name of Theopolis is the Theopolis Institute for Biblical, Liturgical, and Cultural Studies. Uh, we never use that full name anywhere. It's either Theopolis or the Theopolis Institute or TI. Uh, it wasn't our original name. We called ourselves the Trinity House Institute for a short time. Uh, and we were forced to change that. Not quite forced, but we decided to change it because we found out that there was a Trinity Institute in New York City. It's connected to Trinity Church, which is near Wall Street in lower Manhattan. Uh, and that Trinity Institute had been in existence since the 40s, I think. And uh, when we found out that we had a name that was close, that closely resembled that name, we got in touch with them, tried to come to some kind of agreement that uh, they wouldn't try to come after us legally or anything for uh, stealing any of their, any of their, uh, 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 their name or uh, their, their labeling or anything. Um, we weren't able to get any kind of satisfaction. They really didn't respond to us. They probably would have left, it, uh, left us alone, uh, but we didn't want to be in that kind of legal jeopardy. And so at that time, um, Joe Crawford was uh, serving as vice president uh, and uh, 
Joe, uh, Joe and I decided we were going to have to change the name. We had come up with Trinity House Institute kind of by trying to come up with a consensus among the, the, the earliest board of Theopolis. Uh, the board of Theopolis consisted at that time of my, my buddies, people that I had known for a long time that had part, been part of Biblical Horizons or had been supporters of Biblical Horizons, uh, and trying to come to a uh, consensus among any group, even a cohesive group like that, about a name and make it a good name is really difficult to do. Try to name a church and you end up finding kind of a least common denominator name, a name that everyone can agree to, but nobody's real enthusiastic about. Uh, and that's kind of how Trinity House was for us. And so um, Joe Crawford uh, very uh, very wisely uh, suggested that we come up with a name just between the two of us and then we spring it on the board uh, so that the board has no choice uh, but to accept it, especially if we already have like a logo and we have a redesigned website and everything is already, we didn't quite go that far, but we did come up with uh, the name Theopolis. Uh, we consulted with, uh, we, t we talked together about it. We consulted with uh, Imagineering, uh, which is a group, uh, a branding group up in uh, Chicago uh, run by the co-family that uh, we have connections with through Theopolis. Uh, and they helped us kind of think through the, 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 uh, some of the, the branding and the naming issues. Um, we wanted a name that would capture some of the uh, some of the thrust of Theop Theopolis's vision. Um, I wanted to have a name that wasn't going to be um, that was going to uh, riff off of um, the biblical languages. So we could have come up with a name that had Latin Latinesque roots. Um, the name Theopolis is a Greek has a Greek origin, kind of echoes um, the uh, Augustinian idea of the city of God. Uh, uh, in you know we could we could have called ourselves Civitas Dei or something like that, but I wanted something that was rooted in the biblical languages. We we played with some Hebrew Hebrew names, none of those really fit, and so we came up with this kind of faux Greek name Theopolis. It's not really a Greek word, but it captures really what we're after. Uh, it's uh, about building uh, the city of God. We're encouraging uh, churches to build up by uh, in depth study of Scripture, by uh, faithful worship. Um, with psalm singing around the Lord's table, uh, extending uh, the word and the worship of God into the world. Um, Theopolis captures all of that. Uh, and it also rings those Augustinian uh, changes, which I, I, I really appreciate. I'm a great fan of Augustine. And so a, a name that kind of sounds Augustinian was very, uh, very much in keeping what I, with what, I was, what we were aiming for. And around the same time, we also, uh, we also hired uh, a, a branding marketing firm in Missoula, Montana, called Crevin, uh, and Craig and Kevin Piazza. The name Kevin is a you match those two names together, you get Crevin. Uh, Craig and Kevin Piazza ran Crevin, uh, and we asked them to come up with um, a logo and uh, accompanying materials that would go with the logo. Uh, and uh, I say frequently that the the logo that Crevin came up with is the best thing that Theopolis has ever produced. Uh, yeah, we do podcasts. Yeah. Yeah, we do books. Yeah, we we do we do courses, but yeah, we got a logo. We got the best logo. Um, it's uh, it's uh, con concise. Uh, it's no words, which is great. You don't want a logo with a bunch of words around it. Uh, it fits on the little tab. If you got a bunch of tabs up on your computer, it fits on the tab, um, and it really does capture in a in brilliant way uh, what we're about because it's a. Uh, it's a cityscape uh, with a firmament underneath. So you have kind of this uh, cosmic, biblical horizons, James Jordan-esque vision of the world, the city above the firmament that is reflected below the firmament. So we have a heavenly city that's reflected on earth. You've got a city, you could think of the city as being beside the waters. So you've got an earthly city, the Israel that's uh, on, on the ground, on the, on the land, reflected in the sea of the nations. Uh, you have those various kinds of city connotations for the logo. Plus, it's a cross, and so it's uh, it's a it's a um, it's kind of a cosmic symbol symbol with heaven and earth and a firmament between, but taking the shape of a cross, uh, which is uh, you know that's that's the goal is to imprint the cross of Jesus Christ uh, on everything and to see everything made cruciform, everything conformed to Christ, and everything summed up in Christ. So uh, just the, the the logo is brilliant. Uh, the last thing that I, I love about the logo is that uh, I've, I've told a number of people this, that my 
uh, we know that Theopolis will have reached its telos when there's a martyr uh, with his dying breath, with his own blood, makes the Theopolis logo with three fingers in the sand uh, of the arena. That's when we know we've arrived, when, when we get the first Theopolis martyr uh, who dies making the Theopolis logo. And it's possible to do. Not all logos, martyrs can't do every logo, but you can do the Theopolis logo without expending much energy. You can do it in your dying breath. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, um, so with, that, with that name change, uh, uh, Joe and I came up with the name Theopolis. We did present it to the board as a kind of fait accompli. Uh, they agreed to it. What else could they do? Uh, and we had a great logo, and uh, that's that all all that transition has served us well. And I think the name Theopolis uh, was a, was an important change for us because it makes us distinctive. Trinity House just not only is it uh, kind of a lowest con common denominator name, but it kind of blends in with everything else. Everything's called Trinity. Churches are called Trinity. Um, institutes and ministries are called Trinity. Um, but Theopolis is uh, is a unique name that makes us stand out. Theopolis has gone through various permutations. When, I, when we first started discussing it and I first started conceiving of it, uh, what I had in mind was kind of a, uh, a, an ongoing Biblical Horizons conference, just kind of repeat the Biblical Horizons conference a number of times during the year. And we still do that. That's our intensive courses are uh, an extended version, a more acad somewhat more academic version of what we used to do at Biblical Horizons and liturgically organized days, uh, lectures, discussions, um, meals together, uh, fellowship. So that's kind of what I conceived. And I thought of Theopolis in, in the initial stages as primarily a school, uh, a place where we could have students come, the students would bask in the, uh, the glow of our wisdom and our knowledge, uh, and they would, they would just absorb it all. Uh, and it, it didn't take me very long. A few courses in, I realized that the students were going off when we weren't around and talking to each other. Um, this made me a little suspicious that they would talk to each other when, when, when the teachers weren't there. Uh, and I realized that that needed to be part of the vision of Theopolis. Theopolis is not just about um, experienced teachers uh, training um, less experienced pastors and aspiring pastors and church leaders and so on. That's part of the dynamic. But the dynamic is also what happens among the students and the, the kind of community that uh, that. Uh, is uh, fostered by that, uh, the kind of community that's fostered by common worship, for example, during our courses or during our fellows program, the kind of community that's fostered by uh, common meals, which we have uh, on, in our intensive courses or in our fellows program when the students, for the last number of times our fellows program, uh, our students have all lived together in a large rental house in, in Birmingham. Uh, so they've, uh, they've not only had dinners together, uh, They've had, some of them have shared rooms, they share late night conversations, uh, and there's a, there's truly is a Theopolis community that's come out of, come out of the courses and has come out of the fellows program. Uh, and that's become a, a, a crucial part of what we're doing. It's uh, had, it took, it took me a little bit to figure out that that's, that was part of our mission. And it wasn't just kind of an, an, an accident, but that's actually part of what we, what we are trying to do. And out of the, some of those associations, there have been uh, people have joined new denominations. They've transferred. They've cooperated in various kinds of projects, uh, and I expect that to con continue to grow as uh, more and more uh, students come through our, our uh, intensive courses, our certificate program, or our fellows program. I also hadn't envisioned uh, the kind of media extent extensions that we have. We wanted a website. I was thinking mainly in terms of written material. Um, I had to be convinced to uh, even think about a podcast. Brian Motes uh, had to convince me that uh, a podcast was worth doing. Podcast? What is this podcast, I think? I've never heard of this thing called podcast. I've never listened to one. Why should I do one? Uh, but as it turns out, the podcast has been our very best early contact with people. Um, more people learn about the Alba Story podcast than through any other means. Um, I think some of some of the books that we publish, or some of the books I've published, or Jim has published, that's another that's another thing that connects people to us individually, and then eventually they find their way to Theopolis. But Theopolis itself has been primarily through that that particular media outlet, through through the podcast, which reaches thousands and thousands of people, um, and each each episode goes to uh, several thousand people, and over time goes to many many thousand people. So. Um, 
that I hadn't envisioned that at all. Um, I was video phobic when, when uh, before Theopolis started. I had to be convinced to do video work. Uh, I've, I've grown up and been able to do that over the, le over the last few years. So that kind of media outlet, rather uh, not just uh, written material, but uh, video material on YouTube, uh, the podcast, now an app which combines all of those things, various kinds of, uh, various kind of formats. Um, that kind of in initiative is not what I originally envisioned, but it's, uh, it's been uh, a, a, a very, it's a lot, been a lot of uh, not only edifying and useful, but it's been a lot of fun to have that kind of variety. Uh, one of the things I, I realized, uh, this goes back to my initial thoughts about why, why, I started, why we started Theopolis in the first place was out of my own boredom. I like the idea of being kind of nimble in what we're doing. So uh, early on, um, uh, my son Christian and I visited New Hampshire. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Tom Clark, a pastor there, was dying of cancer, uh, and he had some. He had had an incredible ministry in this in this co community of Summersworth, New Hampshire, uh, and had continued that incredible ministry during the course of his cancer. He continued to preach right up until the last. Uh, and uh, Christian and I met up in uh, up in New Hampshire, and we spent a weekend up there and just sat. Tom Clark, uh, this pastor down in front of a camera, and I quizzed him about his ministry in Summersworth and how he had been dealing with this cancer, how he continued to minister and preach and deal with, uh, uh, lead the church through his through his sickness. Uh, and, and not only was that, a, I think a, it's it's up on our YouTube channel, I think it's a, a very edifying and challenging thing for pastors to watch and inspiring thing for people to watch. Uh, but it also was an, a... Uh, uh, something that I couldn't have done uh, in the context of New St. Andrews, in the context of my earlier life, uh, you know, taking a few days off and going somewhere else in the country and you know, hosting a film, that's not something I, I had thought of doing. But Theopolis has had that kind of variety. And uh, um, I th it's, it's good that we didn't end up fixing down on what I had originally planned, which is a school, because that would have inhibited some of these other uh, opportunities and outlets that we've been able to develop. I say a lot that the people are the main product of Theopolis, and that's that's not just marketing or a spin, but that's actually true. What we want to do is to train and form people who will be leaders in churches, will be edifying to churches, so that the church is strengthened and grows, and so the city of God uh, takes form in the earth and begins to uh, shine its light on the cities of men. So that uh, that that uh, that that mission is. Uh, it's really about people. Uh, and of course, uh, we have many, many people that have gone through our courses. We have many, many people, many of them unknown to us, who listen to our podcasts and watch our, film, watch our videos and, and read our materials. Uh, so uh, those are the people we're trying to reach. Uh, the people who come into Theopolis courses, especially into the Fellows Program, are the people who are, uh, we have the most investment in, uh, and we are able to pass on kind of a whole legacy of Theopolis and form them in a Theopolitan way. Uh, and those are that's really where the heart of our work is. Um, but people on the other side, on the other side of that uh, that equation, of course, are the people who have been part of Theopolis. And there are many, many people who have been part of Theopolis over the years. Uh, Jim Jordan has been a constant presence, uh, even when he's not been physically present at Theopolis. He's present in spirit. Uh, he was able to move up to Birmingham for a number of years. Uh, shortly after Theopolis began, and he lived here in Birmingham. Uh, unfortunately, he uh, had strokes and got sick uh, during his time here in Birmingham. and wasn't able to continue at the same level of work that we had hoped. Um, but uh, Jim's presence has been, uh, Theopolis just wouldn't exist without Jim and without the uh, Jim's friendship and all that I've learned from Jim over, over uh, a number of decades. Um, and Jim, of course, has influenced others who've been key to Theopolis, um, Jeff Myers has been part of our part of our fellows faculty. Alistair Roberts, uh, although he hadn't had personal contact with Jim or with me prior to becoming part of Theopolis, uh, his whole imagination in uh, dealing with the scriptures has been formed by studying Jim and listening to Jim and reading Jim. Uh, and then, of course, there are people who have uh, been filled in. Um, my wife Noel started out as basically doing all kinds of administrative work. I I was doing a lot of administrative work, just running things. Uh, that was not a long-term solution to anything. 
Noel was doing it for free. I'm really bad at it. So it was really important that we get somebody in place, people in place to do that. So uh, Brian Motes came on board uh, and a variety of different things that he's done, he's settled into uh, what he's really good at, which is uh, media, filming, recording, editing recordings, uh, doing, our, doing our podcast, uh, now doing our app, uh, and has been invaluable to the work we've done and has given all these, all these outlets that, uh, I, that's, I, that I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, and then my daughter, Emma, Emma, Emma now Thompson, uh, came on board a few years ago and took up a huge burden of work um, that uh, I had been trying to do. I, I wasn't very good at it. I wasn't good at tracking things. I was too distracted and, and uh, um, attention, my, my attention deficit dis disorder would kick into gear and I wouldn't keep track of the things I was supposed to be keeping track of. Emma's been invaluable. Uh, the board has been great. Uh, we've had uh, uh, great teachers, visiting teachers. We've had great um, uh, great uh, permanent faculty on our on our Theopolis uh, Fellows faculty, and we we started a, a uh, an organizational audit uh, late in 2022. Uh, and one of the things that the um, the guy who was conducting the audit asked me to do the first thing he did was to just try to list out the people that were part of Theopolis. Uh, and I thought, well, that's easy, you know, Brian Motes, Emma Thompson, myself, Alistair Roberts is on the payroll. So you've got basically four people. Some people, you know, other people do things very much part-time. Uh, but then I started including other people, you know, the, the fellows faculty and the board members and uh, people who are writing regularly for us uh, and uh, some, of the, some of the fellows who are now um, contributing, for example, to our Theopolis uh, exploration series. Uh, and um, after a couple of hours, I had like 40 names of people who were uh, part of Theopolis. And... Uh, it's it's grown from basically Noel and me trying to run things into a uh, a, a, a decent size, still very still very trim, uh, but a decent size operation, uh, and um, uh, with a uh, a growing uh, a growing uh, ex a growing extension and growing audience. Um, I'm grateful for all the people who've contributed to that. Ultimately, I'm grateful, of course, to the Lord who has blessed us, who brought uh, Arthur K. our way and uh, his funds at the beginning. Uh, the, Lord, the Lord arranged that. I didn't arrange that. The people who become part of Theopolis, many of them I didn't know before Theopolis began, and they become key to uh, the Theopolis in the present and will be key to Theopolis in the future. Uh, the Lord is doing this, and the Lord's work is uh, what we want to continue to try to do for the next, the next 10 years and beyond.